semi cut me off and they were just like yeah just letting you know we played like ultra music festival last year <laughs> and i was like oh okay <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Eddie. thanks Eddie. hello everyone and welcome back to behind the tune and welcome to the official first episode with my good friend jordan aka fortune um thanks for being here this is a little bit of history here first episode of behind the tune yeah uh thanks for joining me um if you want to introduce yourself a quick 30 second 15 second blip of who you are yeah and then we'll get into the to get into the episode well, first off, thank you for having me, man. It <laughs> feels all good. Yeah, so good to be here, and I'm so grateful that I was the first person that you yeah. wanted to have on. And yeah, as Nikita said, my name's Jordan, aka Fortu. Um, been DJing for a while now, and yeah, I'm sure we're gonna get into that. So yeah, I'll, um, I, and I'm pre disclaimer as well. As you probably know, I suck at condensing information. No, that's <laughs> so like, the task of doing a thirty second intro. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh but yeah, no, I'm sure we'll we'll get further into it, but that's that's me for now. Yeah. Well yeah, we'll start off with the with some of the big news coming out of uh out of views that you're playing at Sash. Yes. In a couple of weeks. Yeah. First Sash debut. I remember we Jordan and I used to work at a pub locally to where we actually uh, like live and um, when I started working there I sort of knew of Jordan a little bit as a DJ but yeah him and I used to have the conversations of playing at like Jordan playing at Sash and playing at Lost Sundays and that was only like middle of last year so eight yeah. months later and now you're debuting at Sash and hopefully there's more to come after that how yeah. do you, how was that like um, what was it, like an email they sent you or did they just DM you saying hey well basically um, Tom and I um aka capture mm. people listening and friends listening you know have like probably seen us on lineups together in that way um but yeah tom and i we've been playing together for ages um we just love sash and we used to go to sash um well i say used to because we haven't really gone in a little while <laughs> um you know life's just been pretty busy but yeah, like the first few times we went to Sash, we were just like, man, this would be such an awesome place to play at. Mm. And it just seemed so far away. You know, we we were both so... Ex- like, we both knew it could hopefully happen, but we knew that it would be, you know, it'd be it'd be hard. Yeah. You know, because it is Sash and they are such an established yeah. company. Um, but then, yeah, basically we just used to go to Sash pretty frequently. And then at one point we met the dude who uh books djs uh for them and we just went up and just said hey and just had a bit of a chat and then from there we just reached out and just said that we'd be keen to jump on if they're ever looking for Mm. people to do a warm-up set and then yeah um kemba his name is he's an absolute legend he was just like yeah send through a mix and we'll check it out and then yeah we recorded a mix and like I guess like this kind of leads into what I was saying before about like warm up sets yeah. and like trying not to replicate what Tom said already yeah. in his podcast. But like I guess yeah, warm up sets are so hard like in a way to do because you are essentially getting the party started without coming out the gate too heavy. Mm-hmm. And I guess like the reason why Sash has the reputation they have is because they're really good at like this. Like they, the reason they have the reputation that they have is because they just do such an awesome job of like getting like the perfect kind of warm-up set going where it's kind of cruisy Mm. and then it ramps up and then by the end of the day or the night it's just pumping and so yeah like being able to fit into that was like it's it's a hard thing um so yeah like and with life being so busy it just like took us you know a while to finally get it you know Mm get to where like get to playing um you know and like as you said like i've told you like told you how big it would be from like how much like how excited i was to eventually do it when we were working together yeah um and so yeah like after i think a year of just tom and i just going back and forth to the drawing board we finally got the mix sorted and sent it to kemba and he was happy with it Mm. and then got back like got back to us with a date and it was just so awesome and like so grateful to him and obviously the rest of the Sash crew yeah. that despite it taking so long <laughs> for us to get get it to him, he was still like so keen to get us on. So yeah, just massively grateful to him and that crew and it just yeah, so feels so surreal to finally see our name on there. Yeah, that's yeah, I remember yeah, yeah I remember scrolling through Instagram just randomly and then um 
seen no you actually you sent me an invite on facebook mm. i said sash and i was like oh just a random sash invite and then i saw that your name and tom's name was underneath and i was like holy shit yeah this is crazy then i went on the sash instagram and everything and i saw that they actually made an event and you yeah. guys want it how does it feel to be playing like a sash event back to back with arguably one of your one of your really good friends oh man it is just so so sick yeah. like especially because you know i think like this would have been before we started working to, oh definitely before we started working together but like we played like our first i don't know like we played i was doing gigs before um tom and i started playing together mm-hmm. but the first gig that we played together was kind of really what got the ball rolling yeah and it was where, where was that it was just for this uh boat party that was run by this dude uh james Strabitsky, who's an absolute legend as well um you know ripples yeah, I think I was in that one. I think I actually came onto the, that. Oh, because yeah. I think your brother was there too. No, no, I don't oh, think he okay. was. No, but I think he might have told me about it. But I think I remember going to that one because me and some of my boys went. Yeah. I think, yeah, that's how sort of you and I know each other as well. Yeah. Mutuals. Oh, true. So I think that's how we um we ended up on that boat party as well. Yeah. Oh, well, there you go, yeah. man. Sorry. I didn't realize that was your first ever gig. I thought I well, knew who you were, oh, like, who yeah. you were, but I didn't realize that was your first proper like. Well, gig. that w- yeah, well, that was the first time that we went for you. Uh, and capture a fortune back to back capture um and yeah like it was just funny because literally uh tom and i only met a couple months before that mm. we met one time through mutual friends and then that time we met we both knew that we we knew that each other dj'd both yeah. of us dj'd and then it was just like do you want to play together this weekend and then we just mixed like a house party yeah. um at, at mine and then got offered to play the boat party and i just thought it'd be so sick to do it with tom after how much fun we had playing yeah. together and then, yeah, so I guess to summarize this long response, like, <laughs> and that's going to be a common theme of this, but we, yeah, played that boat party together. And then from there, we just did back to backs all the time. And it was just, we're both so grateful that we were able to kind of navigate through the scene over the past couple of years mm. together, you know, because it's so daunting, especially when you're coming from our, our way. It's, yeah. it can be hard to kind of break into like yeah, the city 100%, 100%. scene. But, you know, so I guess, again, to summarize, we're both just so excited to be sharing this opportunity together. And yeah. it just feels like it's, it, it's just, I don't know, it's cool that after all this time, this is like the, you know, the break. Yeah, this is just like <laughs> such an important milestone for yeah. both of us and we're just so c- keen to share it together yeah. with us, like with our friends as well. And that's what's awesome about it. Like so many of our friends and people, you know, like even that aren't in our immediate circle have been messaging mm. me saying, you know, congratulations. So, yeah, yeah so sick, dude. Because, yeah, Sash is a huge step. It's probably one of the two, I guess it's one of the biggest, I guess, techno house events in sydney yeah apart from maybe like lost sundays and anything mm. else that goes on on saturdays so that's actually that's like a a massive uh thing to play but your your sound and i guess tom's sound because tom's more of like a mm. drum and bass sort of type yeah and you're more of like a, you'd probably fit into that sash so how's like tom how are you and tom sort of working out like your set for for sash yeah especially with it being such a mellow more of a mellow vibe yeah well i guess what has always uh I guess what's always been so sick about Tom and I and both in a DJing sense mm. and friendship sense is we both just have such a wide appreciation for all different types of music. Yeah. So even though Tom, you know, can play some insane, like <laughs> filthy UK bass under capture, he also froths like really chill, minimal and deep house. And, yeah. you know, it's something that like, and obviously because we've, we've been playing together for so long, you know, And it's awesome because through playing together, we both get to like explore music that we wouldn't normally. Like Mm -hmm. often when we play together, we usually play a lot of like tech and deep house and minimal house. And like, I definitely play that solo as well, Mm -hmm. but you know, like definitely, yeah, like it's, it's still different to the stuff I play and just in the same way that it's different to the stuff he usually plays. So like coming together to it, it's, you know, like it is even though it is more like my sound, mm-hmm. we both kind of equally as invested in it. Yeah. So, yeah. And we, yeah. Like Tom's been traveling around a fair bit. Um, He's been like, he's got family in Queensland. Yeah. So he was up there recently. Um, But now we're back. Like now, now that he's back, we're going to have time to start mm. getting into it. So we're yeah, both okay. just keen for that. Yeah, that's sick. And I guess on the back of that, how do you reckon your sound is sort of, or your music has evolved from when you first started? Because I remember 
again, funnily enough, uh, everything's just full circle. Um, you DJ'd one of my mates' 18s <laughs> back in the day. Really? Um, yeah, it was uh, Hendo's. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. back. It was back then. It was in t- yeah, back then. Um, you were just doing the rounds of doing house parties. Yeah, and just doing DJs at house parties. Which, by the way, like back then, like it was hard to find a good DJ. And I think after that party, I was like, this. I forgot what your name was back then. I think it was just Sprock. Prism. Oh, maybe Prism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I remember I left that one. I was like, that. Yeah, that DJ that Hendo had at his 18th. I want him at every every next house party because like, yeah. house party like they're not easy, but they're also not not too hard mm. but i feel like you had like the the perfect music i guess taste or perfect like music uh blend that you could put into a house party that made it like fun but also didn't make it like too repetitive yeah and you didn't play like repetitive songs thanks man but i guess from there on like what sort of went from like house parties to then becoming like i guess getting into like house techno and then becoming like a dj yeah because obviously you've got like you've been you've been doing djing for i guess since 2018 but i'm guessing earlier than that yeah so what do you reckon's like changed and how did you get to that point of becoming a techno tech house dj well i guess like outside of the house parties that i was doing i was when i was doing those parties i was catering a lot to you know like and that's a big part of djing obviously reading the crowd and so i did a lot of that but then i would listen to a lot of you know music that was aligned with the stuff that i play now Mm. At the same time, I wasn't. I was listening to completely different electronic <laughs> music back then. I was listening to a lot of like trap yeah. and like classic Chinese laundry stuff. That's good though. It's like a good diverse, like a good diverse yeah. music. And, sound. and I just always was at that time just, I'd try and like creep that stuff into like birthdays and stuff. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. But then it just, yeah, like at the time and, you know, with the parties that I was being booked to play, it was like 18, 16 and stuff. People depending on the party i guess but people didn't really want to be in chinese laundry they wanted to just you know be like singing to tunes they know and stuff and so but i'd try and occasionally slip in those types of tracks yeah and then people would just kind of slowly start uh like just clearing the dance floor oh wow and so yeah which is understandable i guess but i don't know i just remember specifically there was one party that i played right at the end of my first year of uni when i think i was 19 um and I just had this, I don't know, it wasn't, I think it was just a build up and that party was the straw that broke the camel's back. I just was like, man, I just want to be able to play the music that I want to play. Yeah. And I I think the only way I can do that is by playing in clubs that play that type of music. Mm -hmm. And so next year I really need to figure out how to make that happen. And then the next year or that next year I went traveling, Mm. which then later contributed massively to me playing in clubs. Yeah. Um, yeah, later down the line. So even though I didn't get into it the, the year after that, like, realisation, yeah, the travelling definitely helped, as I've told you, like, in the Yeah, past. and that was in Europe, wasn't it? Yeah. Because they've got a massive... Their their techno and house scene is way bigger than what we have in Sydney. It's more it's mm. more common. Yeah, Like, exactly. you'll find more clubs there that are, that are playing more that sort of music, whereas here in Sydney, it's more of, like, a, a split, 50-50 split, where, like, you have one side that does, like, the house, and the next side is, like, the R&B, mm. Afro tunes, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, that's cool that you've sort of developed your sound. Mm-hmm. And um, you recently played, or I won't say recently, but this year you played supporting Wongo yeah. in Wollongong. Yeah. How was that? That was crazy, man. Did you, did you like fully, like, was you were you right before him or were you just sort of... I was right after him. Oh, you were after him. Yeah. Okay, how, was, how was that experience? Which, which was wild because, as you know, like, you went to Lost as well. Yeah, yeah. Him and um, Little Fred are closed one of the nights. And, mm-hmm. yeah, again, there's so many of these moments throughout this throughout the last couple of years where it's just like, and my friends kind of, you know, it's a kind of running joke. I always have this thing where I'm like, imagine if you could tell yourself that you would be doing this yeah. you know, X amount of time ago. And I guess like if I was to tell myself whilst watching Wongo at Little, <laughs> uh, not Little Paradise, <laughs> Little Paradise. <laughs> watching Wongo and Little Fritter yeah. at Lost Paradise, that I would be uh, supporting him. Yeah. I would like lose. Yeah. It'd be crazy. So, and he was the nicest dude as well, yeah. which was awesome. Because, yeah, as soon as I went up, he I think he gave me a hug and he was like, oh, good luck, man. And yeah. and it's always nice when you have a um, handover like that. Because, mm. yeah, there's been lots of times where it hasn't been as nice, you know. Oh, really? Yeah, just where <laughs> you just, like, go up to, like, you know, take over from the last DJ and they barely want to talk to you or they just sort of thing yeah oh wow and yeah i guess like that was something i experienced a lot at the start it's Mm. not really as prevalent anymore yeah um 
I don't know why that is, but yeah. How does that make you feel though? Like when that, when they used to happen, did you they like give you like did you get like extra nervous when you went up or was yeah. it sort of just like <laughs> <laughs> No, for sure, man. Like yeah, definitely like the first few times I was playing in the clubs, like I don't know. I think it comes with any industry. Yeah. But there is just yeah, I found that there is like a lot of ego in yeah. in, in the DJing world, like, you know. I don't know, because there is, like, this stereotype of, like, DJs thinking that they're gods because yeah. they, you know, can control <laughs> the room and are in charge of the music. And, like, I never understood that when I was playing house parties because mm. I guess I I didn't really view myself in that way and I yeah. hope that I don't come across that way. No, I definitely don't. <laughs> but, like, so I guess when I came into the club scene and found that experience, I was like, wow, this is so different. But... I guess, like, at the start, it used to make me a bit bummed, but yeah. after a while, you just learn to laugh at it and yeah. just not take it too seriously. Was it, like, big names doing it to you, or was it just sort of, like, any supporting act? That was the funniest thing, dude. It would just be, like, randoms. Or like, any names. Some, the- yeah, like, some <laughs> of them I haven't even seen on, like, a, a lineup yeah. since then, but they just, yeah, act as if they're, like... Just give you a cold all shot. That. Yeah, Even exactly. You're helping them out with their with their set as well. Yeah. On that, I mean, on that I, lineup. Yeah. I remember one time there was this these dudes who came up um after a set that I did and they mm. were they were jumping on after me. And when they came up to introduce themselves, they were just like, Oh hey man, awesome set. And then they said and then I, I went to go respond. I was like, Oh, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. And then they kind of semi cut me off and they were just like yeah just letting you know we played like ultra music festival last year <laughs> and i was like oh okay <laughs> <laughs> thanks, for the, thanks for the information yeah and they were like yeah just letting you know and i was like oh okay cool and i was like well i've got one more song left and they're like okay like easy man like we'll be here and then yeah and just random stuff like that and i'm and at the time like i'm laughing about it now and i was yeah. laughing about it at the time because i was like who <laughs> who introduces themselves in that way <laughs> but yeah like, like, like i said man i don't know what it is but nowadays like i don't really have that experience mm. that often everyone's pretty like respectful and nice that's good then but yeah so yeah that's good and um i want to talk about your radio show mm. that you had with tom obviously i knew about it a little bit when we used to work together and we had a chat about it just before we started recording um sort of run th- run me through what it was and sort of what was the goal of it and then obviously the unfortunate <laughs> downfall of that radio show. Yeah. The death. <laughs> um, well, basically, um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier on in the podcast, Tom and I were really just getting the ball rolling mm. after that boat party. Um, and yeah, it was honestly just, yeah, definitely one of the funnest periods like because yeah like i said man it was just so cool navigating it all together and then at one point i went on orbital radio um because that was where we had our radio show on i went on orbital radio for this dude who ran the station Mm. um called ezra um he basically like i went on his show that he was hosting on the station and then met him through that and then he basically said that they're always kind of looking for people to jump on and do their own show yeah so then i took it to tom and i said would you be interested in like doing a weekly or fortnightly radio show yeah um and yeah we were just both so keen on it because we thought it would be awesome to you know it would allow us to you know meet people within the scene and bring on friends that we'd met already and yeah and then it was just yeah and it was so it was awesome man we just basically yeah we were just basically getting on friends every week or getting on people that we hadn't you know Mm -hmm. met too well yet um and then yeah just after a while when our schedules both picked up it was just getting increasingly harder to devote as much time to it yeah um and yeah we just thought it would be best at that point to just you know close that chapter Mm -hmm. but it wasn't like a you know, obviously it was sad and yeah. it was like, because we did it for like a year and a bit. Mm. So having that every fortnight, it's such a, yeah, like it's sad to leave that. Daily, like it became like a routine. Yeah. But then eventually, like, but yeah, we both knew that it was, you know, like it wasn't like we weren't giving it as much as we were at the start. But then, like I said to you, like not long after that, the whole orbital radio station shut down. Yeah. So yeah, which was sad to hear. Because the dudes who were running it, Ezra, like I said, and and 
his mate Johnny, they were both legends and they yeah. were just so passionate about yeah. putting a spotlight on up and coming DJs and radio hosts and all that. So that but radio was like a, that old radio was like just a tech, like a techno DJ sort of thing or was it just sort of... Oh, it was everything. Like like everything. There was like people who would host uh, shows that would, yeah, like like Latin music and oh, wow. reggae and, you know. So our thing was basically, we weren't really like limited. We wanted to get on as much genres as possible mm. within dance music. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we basically would give DJs a two hour slot to do their thing. Right. And we'd just ask them questions and stuff. And it's awesome because even though, like I said, it's unfortunate that it ended, definitely for me, I would love to at some point get back into radio in yeah. some form. And it's definitely given me a bit of confidence and stuff with that. So, yeah. Cause yeah. How, how was it going? How was it going before it like sort of like how Tape was it, it going off. before? <laughs> now, nah, before like you and Tom decided to sort of call it quits. Yeah. Like, do you reckon if you, if you sort of kept going, you know, let's take out the fact that Orbital Radio did shut down, but if it didn't shut down, how do you reckon you, and how do you reckon your show would have ended up, like what trajectory was it on? Um, like oh, if if the Orbital didn't shut down, yeah, and, and you kept going with the show and stuff. Oh, I guess like the trajectory would have been to just yeah, like just keep getting um guests on that are you know hopefully quite well known mm. within the Sydney scene and I guess the broader uh, music yeah. community. So it would have been awesome to to do that um but yeah i guess like yeah because that was after covid wasn't it yeah or during yeah the, after covid it was after covid so oh i guess like i don't know man like i'm, I'm it, it's such a yeah. strange thing to look back <laughs> on like and after COVID. yeah <laughs> it was just like but it was definitely like after it was like when clubs were opening up mm. and stuff so we didn't have to worry too much about like the I guess, like, the precautions. Restrictions that, and stuff. Like, they were still there, but, like, it wasn't as intense as, obviously, the start of yeah. it all. So, yeah. Yeah. So, what about during COVID? What were you doing during COVID? Were oh, you- well, so, I guess, like, I got home from, like, uh, overseas. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I got home and I was just so ready to get going with it all. Yeah. Because, like I said earlier, that was kind of the trip that really catapulted me yeah before then i was studying psychology and commerce yeah which i loved i found it so interesting but djing and music was always where i wanted to be and europe definitely put me on that path Mm -hmm. um but yeah i got home and i was so excited to get into it and started laying out you know what i was going to do and then covid hit hard <laughs> like you know it was everything quite, went down everything went to shit yeah <laughs> it was just creeping up slowly and then by the time i got back and it settled in thankfully i got back before hotel quarantine and everything yeah. but i got back and then a week or so later every club and venue in the world shut had down. shut down so yeah. and honestly it was like one of the definitely lowest points in my life recently where it was just obviously i'd up to my whole life and everything I was doing yeah. to pursue this one specific yeah. path. And there just, there was nothing that was going to happen in the near future with it. So I guess like I just was trying to get set up for when things do yeah. open up again. You know, I just was trying to record mixes, trying to lay out which event companies and people I was going to message. Mm. And then once it opened up again, then I just, yeah, started to get it going. Yeah. I guess that was, I guess it would have been sort of like a bit of a blessing in a way because you sort of, instead of going in, into it like a hundred miles an hour, yeah. you sort of got the opportunity to plan it out, sort yeah. of find, find your sound as well. Because yeah. I'm assuming you had decks at that point. Yeah. So you had a pair, set of decks at home, so you were just sort of playing around them daily or whatever, I'm assuming because yeah. you had nothing else to do. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> sort of you probably used that time to sort of, you know, plan out. Yeah. And then once everything opened up, you were 100% ready. Yeah. So in hindsight, it was really good mm. in that way. But at the time, you know, I'd got back from, yeah, like 10 months of traveling yeah. in a different part of the world and, yeah, just changing my life. And then to go from that, I guess, like, you know, that was kind of everyone. Everyone went from just life to just just nothingness, <laughs> but yeah. being at home. So, yeah, but I guess, like, at the time it felt really hard and it felt like an uphill battle trying to, like, get stuff going yeah. whilst all this stuff was happening yeah but then like you said man it just ended up being good in the long run because it gave me time to really focus and mm. yeah not not just rush into it 
Yeah, because so. yeah, I'm seeing that a bit of a trend at the moment is that a lot of DJs sort of picked up DJing during COVID. Yeah. And now they're like sort of making a name for themselves afterwards. So I guess COVID was a bit of a blessing. Yeah. In that, in that sense, if you can call it that. Yeah. But um, for like producing and DJing. For sure, man. I mean, you just look at like, you know, definitely didn't get started DJing, I don't think. But like Fred again. Yeah. Popped off, popped off massively. Right after COVID. After COVID, mm. you know. So... Yeah, and now he's like dominating the world. Yeah, he's legit, like the most the most trending artist. Yeah, he's putting Forte and Skrillex back on the map, which is good, dude. It's and it's crazy ace. Yeah, honestly, like it's yeah, it's it's just I think for me definitely a reason why I've jumped on the 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 Fred again. Like you know, like obviously the whole world loves him yeah. at the moment, yeah. and like what definitely drew me to that is like it's just so cool. Like I said, in such an industry where, and I guess it applies to all industries, but like where there's so much like ego and stuff. Mm, yeah. Obviously, how you portray yourself in interviews and stuff can be different to how you actually are in real life. Yeah. But from everything I've seen from Fred again, he yeah. just seems like such a lovely dude. Yeah, he's really humble. Yeah. So to see someone like that where he currently is is just so awesome. Yeah. I think it's good for the scene as well because obviously they headline Coachella. Oh, yeah. Two weeks ago, him, Skrillex, and Fortet, which is just insane. Because yeah. besides, like, obviously, Calvin Harris, mm. like, if you told me, like, there was going to be, an, like, that sort of trio headlining. Yeah. And probably getting a better reception than Frank Ocean. Yeah. Who's more of a, I guess, Coachella artist. Yeah. Rather than, you know, Skrillex, Fortet, and, and Fred again, which is just massive for the scene because it sort of puts... It obviously puts them higher up on the map, but it also puts the actual scene, so it gives people that aren't as big uh, more of an opportunity to sort of reach a new audience exactly sort of set that platform up 100 percent, man that's why i'm i'm so stoked about that whole situation because i've been like a fortet fan for a long time mm. um and i guess there's always that thing where like when an artist that you love starts to get recognized by yeah. a lot more people it's like oh you know i yeah. you know it was kind of special when it was just like when you only kind of knew that person, mm. not claiming that I knew Forte. Like, <laughs> and, you know, like, obviously he was mad, like, he was a much bigger deal, I think, over in Europe and the UK. Yeah. But now to see him getting so much, like, love and recognition here and America, yeah. it's awesome. And especially after he played at Pitch, I don't know if you saw his set. Yeah, that's, I was going to actually <sighs> touch on that because, like, I feel like, Leading up to pitch, when the lineup got announced, I didn't really know who Forte was at all. Mm. I, barely, I I probably I didn't think I knew him at all. And then my mates and I were discussing like who do you reckon some of the biggest acts going to pitch are because they don't have like a headliner. They just release like a bunch of acts. Yeah. Sort of up to to decide who's who's the best. Yeah. And we we're discussing and we we're saying like Forte would probably be up there just for what he's doing with Fred again and Skrillex. Yeah. Because at that point, yeah, it was in March. Pitch was, and um, yeah, I think just what he's doing with Fred again and Skrillex sort of made his set that much more iconic yeah because he was like a big name at that point I'm, yeah i'm assuming he would have been a big name to like people like you but to someone like me who wasn't aware of him yeah it was crazy to see him being like that's like a, a huge name at this stage right now exactly so man. like it was it was actually really sick to see that yeah yeah and it so. was it was a double-edged sword in a way though because yeah it's so cool to see him getting that you know recognition but at the same time i remember i had work that weekend oh mm. he was playing lost sundays oh and yeah, before right, pitch yeah. there was i think still tickets available and then i was like oh you know i'm gonna try to get my shift covered and then in the time that he played pitch to like <laughs> me trying to get my shift covered the tickets for lost sunday sold out instantly because i think like everyone saw videos yeah. and stuff of how good he was at pitch so everyone from sydney was like oh i'm gonna jump on yeah lost 100%, sundays 100 yeah so he I was, was uh, yeah it was great i don't know if his lost sunday set was the same as his pitch set but yeah i guess was, Sorry, go on. Oh, no, I was going to say, yeah, such, a, such a variety of music. Mm. Like, it was crazy. Like, he was playing, like, some, yeah, like, drum and bass, and then he played some, like, just tech house. Mm. And then he played a remix of, um, I don't know if it's gone, it's gone around at the moment, but the Taylor Swift um, Love Story remix. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was going around. Everyone was absolutely screaming that song, and I was like, this is just insane. Like, yeah. we're, we're in the middle of a bush in the desert, yeah. basically, and we're singing Taylor Swift to the <laughs> That was, like, that was a pretty iconic moment. Yeah. But, yeah, it's pretty crazy, and I think just... Looking even at Skrillex as well, the fact that I'm, I don't know about you, but yeah, back in when I was in year seven, year mm. six, year seven, eight, like Skrillex was like the one thing that you would listen to. Yeah. Yeah, MP3 play, he played Bangarang and all that stuff. Yeah. And now Skrillex is like, he sort of fell, like, I don't say he fell off a little bit, but he was sort of like, no one really, so everyone sort of forgot about him. Yeah. And now he's like, 
once again one of the biggest names in like EDM. Oh, so hundred <laughs> percent. It's so cool to see him still relevant. Yeah. And obvi- yeah, like obvi- and and yeah, because I think like during that period where Bangarang and stuff was mm. the biggest thing, that was uh like yeah, he was really like amongst it. Yeah. Then, but then yeah, like you said, like. I think like that dubstep kind of sound. It definitely has like a. Obviously, has at the it, yeah. time that was like the coolest, 100%. newest thing, and it still definitely has an audience. But it's cool that he's kind of adapted, mm. and yeah, like definitely more housey now. Yeah, which is so cool. And yeah, I love, I love like yeah, his most recent songs. I don't know if you've listened to his like new albums. No, or, I know that he came, him for ten and Fred again came out with a song, the mm, baby remix. Yeah. That one came out. But that's more like yeah, that's not really I guess I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it's not my style. It's not yeah. really like the drum and bass. Yeah. Sort of UK mm. sort of stuff. I don't know. But I, I still appreciate it. I yeah, think it's cool sure. just seeing them three. Yeah. Going absolutely crazy. And with Fred again, it's insane that like now he sort of become this very household name, but people don't know that who he was before. Mm. He was like this massive producer who was producing some of the best songs. Yeah. I think I read a stat or something that at one point he had like 40% of the top 100 songs. Yeah. He produced like 40% of the top 100 songs. Yeah, exactly. And then he sort of, yeah, I think his Boiler Room definitely yeah. put him up there. Like his Boiler Room, I remember when that came out, that was like, every, it was going everywhere. Yeah. People that weren't fr- fans of Fred again were fans of him. People that like sort of don't like him now still look at that Boiler Room and go, that was still iconic. Yeah. So I feel like love him or hate him, that Boiler Room sort of, I wouldn't say put him on the map because he was sort of a name yeah. before then, but I think it made him more mainstream. Oh, definitely. After that Boiler Room. And I guess, yeah, that's, yeah, because Boiler Rooms in themselves are such a massive milestone yeah. for DJs. And so I guess, yeah. And it's so cool that, like you said, he was pulling the strings behind so many famous records mm. and then, find, like, yeah, he just decided to, like, put himself out there. Yeah. And now everyone knows, like, can match, like, a name to the face. Yeah. But yeah, it's so cool, man. Yeah, that was. Did you did you end up going to see? Did you see him live when he came to Australia? No, because like I guess what I was saying earlier, or leading into what I was saying earlier, is that yeah, at the time I don't know. I just I wouldn't say like I thought he was overhyped, but yeah. I was just like, oh, you know, I don't know if it's like worth you know buying tickets for or anything. Mm. Um, you know, at, that was obviously my thinking at the time, and then. Yeah. By the time he came here, I was like, dude, this guy's amazing. Yeah. And I fully, like, yeah, succumbed to the the hype. And then, yeah, and ro- like rightfully, because like I said, man, like I'm so stoked to see someone with his talent and yeah. just someone so nice 100%. doing what he's doing. Um, So, yeah, but like I was I was so spewing that I didn't get to go because mm. like I said, by that point, I was so keen. Um, But yeah, no, but I'm sure next time he comes. we be bigger than that. He'll, oh, he'll be bigger. for sure. Be, where was he playing? What, was he playing at? I think it was Horton. Horton, no, he's definitely playing a bigger venue than yeah, that. Horton's, definitely. Hey, Horton's not big enough for him at this yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was the same mentality between like me and my mates when he sort of announced his tour. Mm. We were sort of like, oh, he's a bit overhyped at this point because like he was like everywhere. Like TikTok, that's all yeah. I saw. I, I was literally on TikTok and also it was Fred again, Boiler Room, Fred again, concerts, all that sort of stuff. And then it was just always coming up. So I feel like it sort of became like a. It was like, yeah, you just kept seeing it so much. They sort yeah. of desensitized the whole fact that he yeah. was around. But. Yeah, it would be sick to see him, I think, like, live. Yeah. Even though, like, he was... I, w- I wouldn't say he's overhyped now. I feel like he sort of hit a... Oh, no. I feel like he's... Uh, what are you, What's it called? He's appropriately rated. Yeah. He's not overrated. Yeah. He's, you know, he's like... Yeah, I think he's he's awesome. Yeah. I think, yeah, <laughs> I think that as well. I think he's super talented. But, yeah, I think he sort of... After that boiler room, he had, like, a period where he was, like, sort of still a bit underrated and mm. then he sort of like hit the mainstream yeah and then went crazy but you know it's all good for him he's living the life at the moment yeah <laughs> so i mean you can't really um say anything about it yeah um i was gonna ask as well quickly or not quickly mm. but what are your i guess speaking of coachella what are your top three i guess things that you, sets or festivals you want to play at so like yeah let's go one year and then Three years and then the end goal. So like the once you hit your final form, where do you want to be playing? <laughs> final form, <laughs> transcended. <Yeah. laughs> um, let me think. So one year, three year, and five years. Yeah, five, five. Yeah, I guess long term. Because hmm. you've already you hit the sash goal, so you can't say sash anymore. Yeah, I guess like <laughs> that was like the the biggest thing. Yeah. Um, for me, for, for ages and yeah. So that's I'm trying to think, man. I don't know. I just um, 
like any local any like Aussie festivals potentially or even like Aussie Aussie events like any like Sydney based events Melbourne events I think like yeah I don't know I think like I think like in a in a year's time it would be dope to like venture out to um just some other like state to play like yeah, outside right. of New South Wales particularly Melbourne. Yeah, Melbourne. I've yeah. never been to Melbourne before. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, like it. It just seems like such a sick nightlife scene. It is. Yeah, their scene. Yeah. Is, <laughs> their scene is is like on steroids compared to Sydney. Like little, I think I think it's Little Collins Street or Collins Street. It's mm. literally just got techno clubs all all lined up through. Yeah. That's where like Revs is. Yeah. And all those other clubs and like yeah, that would be a sick one to play. At. Like even anywhere in Melbourne. Oh yeah. All those venues just literally sell out. For sure, yeah. I think I did. I think definitely revs would be so cool. Mm. Um, so I guess yeah, playing there would be awesome. Mm. And then I guess in three years' time, I hopefully will be able to play overseas somewhere. Oh yeah, okay. Um, you know, uh, I don't know if it's in three years. It would be awesome if it mm. is. But um, I'm trying to think of what the name of it is. But right. have you ever heard of uh, ADE? No. Right. Explain it. <laughs> uh, it's basically this yearly uh, conference that happens in Amsterdam. So it's called Amsterdam Dance Event. Right. And basically for the whole week that the conference is on, mm-hmm. every single kind of relatively well-known person within electronic music is yeah. there. Um, and what happens is, is for the seven days, 24 hours a day, there's constantly an event on for ade right so you can get a pass which allows you to go to like whatever parties you want or you can just buy tickets specifically to whichever one you want to go to yeah okay so when i was over there i bought tickets to go watch rufus on one night yeah okay i think i remember you telling me this yeah i didn't know what ade was yeah so i watched rufus and then i think the next night or two nights later watched um i don't know if you know them but uh bonobo and john hopkins yeah, I know who they are. I yeah. saw John Hopkins um, supported Rufus when he came out of Sydney. Yeah. So I saw him. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I went to that. I went to that and that was just, yeah, like, I think that was properly what made me think, wow, this yeah. would be awesome to do. Because, yeah, like, basically, the like, I, like I said, it's throughout the entire city, all different venues. Mm-hmm. So you can walk into, like, a bar and then there's just some like big name well big name just playing there oh really or it's like big warehouse spaces um and so i watched uh yeah um all those artists that i mentioned before in this big warehouse <sighs> i'm trying to think of what the <laughs> name is man ndsm maybe i don't know it's got like a <sighs> like the actual warehouse the actual warehouse yeah. you have to catch a ferry to it from the mainland i guess yeah. and then yeah you get there and it's just like I just I just was at the time I was like man I would love to play here. Yeah. So whether it's for ADE or something else playing like a gig over there that sort of venue would be awesome. Yeah. Was but the warehouse like a sick Yeah. Was like a, like a like a standard warehouse. <laughs> it was just like a massive long warehouse. Mm. Um and yeah, it just I can't remember the name of it and it's killing me. Yeah. But like it would it would yeah, that's basically the plan. So if I can't do that in three years, just playing overseas yeah. um would be awesome. And then I guess in five years time, I would just I think that like one of my ultimate goals, which I've wanted ever since I was probably in high school, yeah. was to do an essential mix for BBC. Um, I don't know if you've ever listened to them. No, I think I think I've heard of the Essential Mix. For yeah, BBC. yeah. It's just like a two-hour mix that they play on on the BBC, and um, yeah, like pretty much all the biggest DJs in the world yeah. do it. That's in London, isn't it? Uh BBC. I think that I, I think they may be based in London, yeah. but it's you know across the whole mm-hmm. um of the UK. Um, but yeah, and you, it's it's like worldwide. Yeah. Um, but some of my favorite artists have done mixes for the. For it and it's just so cool because you can just ex- explore whatever genre you want and my favorite mixes on it just like flow through all different types of genres yeah. so i guess doing that and then also like doing a boiler room would be sick yeah boiler room that there yeah, that would be insane but i feel like yeah once you, if you get into europe once you get some skin in the game yeah that, then from there it's like the world's your oyster yeah <laughs> once you're actually in europe so that, yeah i think boiler room would be a sick goal to have yeah like, i think 
Yeah, sorry, go no, on. No, you go on. No. Oh no, <laughs> I think I think yeah, it's um, yeah, I, th- I think I've n- I've never really like sat down. I guess like I kind of have a rough plan of where I want to be at at certain points. Yeah. But I think yeah, I'm grateful that you kind of asked me that because it you know made me reflect on <laughs> you know where I actually want to be. But I guess yeah, in like a year it would be sick to play mm. outside of New South Wales and then. Yeah, three years play somewhere overseas, and then five years boiler room in a central mix. Yeah, so. you, would you want to play any of the, like Australia, like any of the Aussie festivals, like Lost like Lost Sun, Lost Paradise? Sorry. Yeah, Lost Paradise Pitch. would be oh awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, like going there last year, pitch as well. That would be so sick. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think like definitely that would also feed into like the three years. If I'm in three yeah. years playing those types of events, that would be so sick. Yeah. So I feel so. like, yeah, Lost Paradise sort of gives the opportunity for, like, up-and-coming DJs because, um, I don't know when you were there, but do you remember that ha- stage I was, like, on the hill? Yeah, yeah. That stage, always during the day, they always play, like, they always be DJs there. Yeah. And it always give, like, I'm not sure. I'd, I obviously never heard, I've, I've, I haven't heard of them, but it gave me, like, I was able to see, like, other, oh, I think Pitch the same as well. Like, there were so many artists there that I've never heard of, and then once I saw them, I was like, I'm a fan. Yeah. Straight away after, after, after I, um saw their set so i think yeah it's good the aussie festivals they they add a lot of like local yeah and it was wild to see quite a few people in the lost paradise lineup yeah that either me and or me and tom know person like no personally yeah or we've like been on similar lineups to them and i guess this goes back a bit to the start but i think one thing that's made me so excited since landing this sash gig mm. is just I think like uh, like me a year or two ago would have thought like it's possible but like it's just it's going to be a long road to get there. Yeah. And I guess it was but like I guess it just showed me that if I if you do kind of want something bad enough and work hard yeah. enough for it it can be achievable. 100%. And it's hard because throughout this journey there's definitely been times where it's just like man this isn't happening. And you just get in your head about it. Yeah. But I guess that's what that's the times where you really need to just keep pushing. Yeah. And I'm just so grateful that I've got so many amazing people around me who, yeah, make me kind of believe in myself when I'm struggling a bit with that. Mm. So yeah. So how 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 I guess on that how do you sort of stay motivated in that in those sort of times? Because I'm sure you experience them. So yeah. Like, how do you sort of stay motivated during that time? I guess like I just. I just, <laughs> there's, it's, it's definitely not like, it's, it's hard to kind of go into this when I'm not, not going into this. It's hard to like, I guess, apply this in, mm. in a lot of, it depends on the situation, but yeah. I always tell this to my brother. So my younger brother, Josh, who you yeah. met bri- <laughs> briefly at the village. Um, but yeah, basically he once told me when I, I think it was like the year that I'd decided to defer uni and like before i went traveling i just started like doing music production Mm -hmm. and like trying to get into that yeah and then i was just telling him about the stuff that i'd been learning and i think he was probably in like year 10 or year 9 he was Mm. really young yeah and it's funny because obviously he's 19 now but (laughs) i just still hear his like prepubescent voice in my head (laughs) being like whatever you do just don't give up yeah um and like i don't know it just kind of resonated with me and i think every time i'm having doubts i just try and remember yeah like just having his voice i guess tell me not to give up it just keeps me going a lot yeah but obviously like i said there's times where it feels really like i'm struggling like tougher than others and yeah and i guess what i do to stay motivated during that is i just i don't know i just feel like i just when i dropped uni to pursue this the whole idea of it was that like, I've just got no backup plan Mm. and I'm just going to like, I just, me knowing there's no safety net will make me just go try as hard as I can. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I've just put myself in fight or flight and yeah, I guess it's just been so good because every time I am having doubts, I just say to myself like, this is what I'm doing and there's no backup plan at this point yeah and then it just keeps me going and i guess it also just is the fact like the main driving force behind why like i just yeah i just i just never want to give up because i know that if i give up there's nothing really obviously i can redirect paths yeah of course of course but at at this point in time it's really all i've got yeah so Uh, yeah obviously that's sick it's good yeah but like obviously you put yourself in that fight or flight but i mean it's working out right now 
Yeah. We've got Sash in a few weeks and who knows after that. Yeah. So, and like, I think... Yeah. No, you go on. <laughs> oh, no, I think definitely... Um, yeah, I think there's a dude that I um, really look up to, which I think I maybe told you about him and anyone who knows me knows that I'm obsessed with him, but it's Struthless. No, I've never... I don't think you've told me. Really? About. I don't know who that is either. <laughs> wow. Well, he's, he's basically a... Um, a Sydney based uh he does all different things. He's like a cartoonist, he's an animator, mm-hmm. he does podcasts. Yeah. He's yeah, he's just like a jack of all trades, but he's just like a creative dude who does a YouTube channel as well and he t- talks a lot about ways of, you know, trying to get into the creative industry. Yeah. Um and dealing with all different types of, you know, right. mental mental health issues and how that ties into being creative and yeah, he's just like one of the most inspiring people for me. Right. Um, and I'm trying to think of where this was going. Um, where, where did you, f- how did you find him? You sort of just like on YouTube one day or oh, scroll well, on through any f- I, like social media and you just sort of, he's got like really, uh, he, he does. I think like he was pretty big on Instagram mm. before he started popping off on other things because yeah. he would do memes, but he would draw them. Right. And so you've probably seen his art style. And if you go to yeah, most likely, <laughs> if you go to most places in Newtown, he's got like loads of like, things that he's done for different businesses. Yeah. Um, and I found him through Instagram and then I found him through YouTube. Right. To be honest, you might've actually known, have you ever seen a video? It was like a 60 second video, um, like ages ago. And it was why it's cheaper to do a Coke bender in Mexico as opposed to Sydney. No, I don't think so. He basically just like like, and it was, it was a piss take. Yeah, yeah. You know, he was just basically laying out like the, like how much flights will cost you for like a return <laughs> and ver- like all the like all the stuff versus like when you go out in sydney yeah, yeah. you know hotel room kebabs yeah all these like you know like typical like points of like a night out and i think that video blew him up yeah i was gonna ask that the video yeah. sort of put him on the map <laughs> and then he just was, was doing videos like that like um like these 60 second videos of like just all different random stuff like ch- hacks essentially mm. Um, and then I think once he had that platform, he started using it to like do self-help videos. Right. Okay. And I'm, as most people who know me, I'm massively into a lot of like self-help, I guess. Yeah. yeah of course. Um, just, yeah. And like, yeah, I just love his stuff. And I think I was, uh, what was I, what was I going into before? I'm trying to think of the <laughs> initial question that you asked me about like mo- him. Like motivations and like how you stay motivated during like tough times and like when you sort of. I guess feel like giving up or you feel like you're not really moving anywhere. I think you sort of went into Struthless a little bit. Yeah. Like you, like he's like one of your main yeah. like inspirations. Oh yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, man. Wow. I'm so glad that we got back to there. But I guess like he t- does an awesome video about why quitting your job and pursuing your passion, like in of itself yeah. is sometimes a bit of a dangerous idea. Mm. Like, in the world that we currently live in, you know, or this reality, I guess, you need to make a living. And so it's not like I've kind of, like, I'm still working, as you know, we work together. Yeah, of course. Still, like, doing something to, like, financially support, support myself. Yourself, yeah. And I guess that's what you need to do. But I guess, like, yeah, just trying to find a balance between working and being able to pursue mm-hmm. your passion. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like, I guess, like, even though I kind of, switch paths from uni like i'm still able like yeah i guess like what i was trying to say before is like i'm like i'm yeah i'm like i'm I'm in a situation now where i can still do djing and focus on that yeah. as well as work and i think that's the the good balance to have it shouldn't just be for anyone listening yeah you know like just completely like doing nothing like, yeah yeah you need yeah you need that balance because you'll you, you lose yourself like you'll just like go insane yeah <laughs> if you don't have that balance yeah i feel like unless you sort of have the opportunity to go 100 percent, yeah you probably shouldn't take it yeah and i think what's awesome as well is i guess like i i i feel like i do i like i love to work mm. you know um and i love because right now hospitality is what i'm doing yeah. outside of djing and i love hospitality as well yeah um and so i guess it's really easy for me to amidst other life things like overload myself and like you know there's been times where i just like am working heaps and then doing heaps of djing stuff yeah. and trying to do all different types of things on top of that and then i guess like i'm really grateful when i have friends uh, and family be like you know 
like it's good to work and it's good to do other things but like you know keep you in check yeah exactly yeah, like good. you know like djing is ultimately what you want to do so if you need to like cut back on not just work but cut back on other things to allow time for that yeah you know you should you should yeah think about that as well so like sort of like you've been burnt out before oh yeah do you think you've been burnt out from like your like your job or do you think you've been burnt out from djing or is it more of a combination of just sort of Mm. doing a lot at the same time i think it's just like mainly the djing like i think like if i was just you know working i wouldn't like feel it as much yeah but i guess like yeah with the djing it's just funny because there's just a running joke um, like with my family and friends i guess of like what do i do all day like (laughs) because like when i'm not working yeah people try to call me and i'm like i can't like do stuff today i'm like really busy yeah and like i think like I mean, I'm sure a lot of people, like, don't really think this way, but I, I think some people obviously just think that as a DJ, you just rock up to the gig yeah. and play music and then walk away. Yeah. When, <laughs> like... I think I've noticed that as well, sort of, I guess, being in the scene a bit more recently. Is yeah. Really, it's a lot more than just, yeah, playing at a gig or playing at a festival a couple of times a year. Yeah. There's so much work that goes into it and, like, releasing music and, you know, practicing. Yeah. And, like, perfecting your craft. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think when I'm not playing gigs, it's always kind of just like organizing my music, organizing myself for gigs, like teeing up gigs, trying to get more into making my own music. So there's always stuff to be done. Um, So yeah, I'm like pretty, but yeah. And I guess with that eventually comes, you know, if you're just doing that solely and you're not splitting your time with work or seeing friends and family, Mm. You just you do feel that burnout, yeah. and it's the most horrible feeling. I don't know if you've ever experienced it with maybe not with DJing, but I feel like I've I've experienced burnout in other senses. But yeah, in particular, like with DJing, what what do you sort of like go through? I guess do you like sort of just mm. don't feel like making music, booking gigs? Do you sort of just like get, I guess push to the side for that moment while you're like burnt out? Yeah, you just feel like everything's pointless, and mm. you know you just don't have any desire to do anything with that stuff and you just procrastinate i guess yeah yeah so i think like i'm just grateful that i'm grateful for like i've I've learned so many things in the short like relatively short time that i've been doing this stuff yeah but i guess that's one thing that i've been massively grateful to pick up on before things get too serious that's good knowing when to like calm down a little bit um because yeah it's hard once you get to that. I think like now I'm at a point where I can feel the burnout coming. Right. And then I'm just like, all right, I'm going to change Chill something. Yeah. But they're like, unfortunately that had to come from just like reaching a point yeah. where you just can't do anything. So yeah. But yeah, no, nah. so far I'm in a, I'm in a good place at the moment. That's good. That's good to hear. <laughs> but yeah. And I guess like it's hard as well because like the hardest thing about doing this sort of thing is that there's just, there is a lot of, um, there isn't a load of security. Yeah, of course. You know, with any like sort of creative thing, like, you know, there's so so many times where there's factors outside of your control mm. and it's really hard because I guess you throw everything you can at this thing yeah. and then for some reasons it just doesn't end up happening or mm. things don't happen the way you want them to. Yeah. And so I guess it's really hard to like um, not get bogged down by that. But then again, I think it comes down to just the way that you look at it and trying to keep in mind that there are, uh, you know, sometimes in life in general, there's yeah. just forces that are out of your control and how much you uh, take them on board 100%. is how much it affects you, I guess. Yeah. So you just got to keep seeing like, you just got to keep, I guess, seeing the end goal. Yeah. And, like, see the end goal and sort of know that that's what you're working towards. It's not about, it's about the... I guess, would you say it's more for you about the destination or do you reckon it's more for you about the journey? I think that my brain believes it's about the destination. Yeah. I feel like definitely over the last couple, like year or so, I've definitely realized a lot of my unhealthy ways of thinking Yeah. Um, and how they do affect me when it comes to this stuff. I think like I am a person that focuses a lot on results yeah. rather than the process. Right. And yeah, I think it's ultimately i think like if you focus too much on the results you get you just get hung up and you get too caught up on what you're not doing and even when you do amazing things you think oh like yeah you could be doing more yeah yeah 100 percent. and so i think recently and i mean super recently it's funny that you bring this up i've just been (laughs) 
actively trying to remind myself of, you know, like just focusing on what I'm doing now, especially when it comes to production. Like I said, I've been trying to like get more into making my own music. Mm -hmm. And I think what always deters me and why I keep going back and forth with it is because I get really motivated and then I hit a roadblock and I start to just get in my head and think I'm never going to be able to do this. Yeah. But I think now I'm really starting to like focus on just the fact that hitting roadblocks is okay yeah. because it gives you the opportunity to learn and you need roadblocks yeah. in the journey to get to the destination. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that's, a, that's actually a great explanation. I think yeah. You couldn't have put it any better. Um, With I, anything as well. Yeah. You know, like obviously it's like applicable to what I'm doing, but you just, yeah, it's, it's so hard and like being, I guess, a, a perfectionist and someone who focuses a lot on results, mm-hmm. you know, it's just not healthy or sustainable in the long term. Yeah. To, and you need to have a focus on results yeah. to have something to to work towards. Yeah, 100%. But it shouldn't be the only thing, in my opinion. No, that's good. No, I completely understand what that answer is. Yeah. Appreciate that insight. I think it's awesome. No. Nah. They're ready to give that insight. Someone like, obviously, a DJ that's come out of Sydney. Mm. Obviously, big things coming for you. And sort of <laughs> give, that, give that perspective of um what it's actually like. Sort of, because obviously, up on stage... And yeah. on Instagram, you you know, you're this one person, but mm. people forget that you're also an actual person behind yeah. behind the scenes. And it's good to sort of get that perspective of what it's actually like. It's not always just about like partying no. and like going out to clubs and like playing gigs and seeing, meeting all the people that it's actually like, there's struggles and there's challenges with it. Yeah. And, like, it's about just managing them. And I think honestly, when it comes to that, you just need, like you said, to just have uh, like... Yeah, again, like not focusing too much on results, but you need to also just like have a tunnel vision Mm. and just kind of focus on what's happening with you. Because I think another thing which I've learned massively is just how dangerous it is to compare. Yeah, 100%. Because especially when you're like in this sort of field, you compare a lot based off like your skills, I guess. Like there's been times where like I've been bummed out because I've seen someone playing something or I've like, yeah, I've seen someone playing something and I've been like, man, like I feel like... I am like capable of doing yeah. that. Why aren't I doing that as well? But you just never know like what people, what, what, what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah, 100%. Who knows who like, and that's why it's important because again, you can get really bummed out and think, is it me? Like, am I, do I need to be better? Yeah. What can I be doing? But it's not about that. Like, and I guess like it's so many people probably know this already about music and a lot of other things, but you know, as much as skill is a massive part of it, it also is about like the people that you know. Yeah. And so, yeah, I guess like another thing that I've learned is just to not get too f- hung up on like comparisons, comparison. Yeah, and like yeah. when my, like what I'm doing, like w- if I'm not doing something that I want to be doing at that point, telling myself like, or I guess reminding myself, it's not just about like talent purely, yeah. you know? Yeah. hundred percent. No, I think, <laughs> no, that's awesome. And I think on that note, Mm. We might wrap it up. Yeah, dude. I that don't was, know how long we've been talking. No, that's for. fine. That was an awesome conversation. <laughs> I think you've, you've given perfect information. I think that's a perfect note to sort of wrap it up on. Yeah. Because I feel like we could go for hours about Honestly, these sort man. of conversations. Especially but. given there's no like windows in here. Like, <laughs> yeah. Bleed into the next day and it still feels. But yeah. dude, honestly, it's been so good chatting yeah. to you. Well, thank you too as well. Um, for coming on the show and being the first episode, hopefully setting a bit of a precedent for the next guests that come on. But um, yeah, as I said, awesome chatting to you. Um, if you guys like this episode, make sure you guys obviously like, subscribe. Uh, follow Jordan on Instagram uh, at Fortune or is it at Fortune Music? Fortune Music. At Fortune Music, F-O-R-T-U-E, music. Um, obviously, he's playing at Sash soon. So anyone in Sydney, if you can get around that, that'd be great. Um, but other than that, uh, make sure you follow us on all our socials at Behind the Tune Pod. And I will see you guys in the next episode. Thank you.